Okay, so um, yeah, let me start f um, with a, um, a small summary of what we saw yesterday. So yesterday we were interested in the interior regularity for area minimizing coverings. So the first thing that we said is the very base, first very basic ingredient is the so-called monotonicity formula. This allows you to rescale at each point x in the interior and then touch up to subsequences uh, uh, the so-called tangent cones. And then there is a second uh, um, sort of soft argument, but very important, which allows you to attach at each point an integer number. This integer number is the maximal homogeneity that one of these tangent cones have. So one way of producing tangent cones is simply, or one way of producing area minimizing cones is to take a cone that you already have in a low dimension and simply multiply it by a line. Okay, so I can define the spine of a cone as the maximum uh, 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 dimension of uh, um, a subspace under which this cone is invariant. And so after that, at each point x, I can take the family of all possible tangent cones and I can look at uh, the maximal dimension that, 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 that these uh, spines have. Okay, so this is a number. And according to the number that you attach to the point, you can subdivide your points in the current to stra in strata. Okay? So the maximal stratum in which you have the same dimension as the current are points where after rescaling you see at least one tangent cone which has an m-dimensional uh, invariance. And this is going to be exactly an m-dimensional plane. So these are our candidates for regular points. Okay, and the theorem, I mean the general theorem which is called Angren's stratification theorem is that the Hausdorff dimension of each of these strata is at most j, okay? And the m minus one dimensional stratum is actually empty because the m minus one dimensional stratum should have tangent cones which are area minimizing and which are two m dimensional um, or, or uh, a family of m dimensional planes crossing on an m minus one dimensional plane. And it's easy to, 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 to prove that this is not minimizing, okay? So in particular, Sm minus one of t is m. Okay, and then when you are here, you have two big dichotomies. In the co-dimension one case, you're actually able to show that every time that you have a flat tangent cone, then you're regular. Of course, the opposite, I mean, th this inclusion is obvious if you're regular, if you are at a regular point and you zoom in after the zooming procedure and you see the tangent plane to your smooth manifold. But the interesting point is this other inclusion. And in co-dimension higher than one, you have counterexample. And typical counterexamples are holomorphic subvarieties. So for instance, this guy in the origin. Okay, at that point we have uh, uh, still, I mean, using the intuition that started with the Georgi that when you are sufficiently flat, your area minimizing current should look like harmonic functions. In the case you have a situation like this in which there is a branching singularity, you cannot hope in the neighborhood of one of, of, of for instance, of the origin to describe your current with a single valued function, but you hope to describe it with a multi valued function. Okay, and then we uh, um, we uh, reviewed a little bit what is the theory of harmonic multivalued functions. We have seen that Agnes theory of harmonic multivalued functions gives you that they are regular outside of, of, of a set of codimension two in the domain. And then we have said that somehow to get towards Agnes theorem, we, we essentially want three things. Well, first of all, we want a way of approximating currents efficiently with multivalued functions. And we didn't speak too much about that. Okay, then 
We mentioned that the hardest part is the so-called center manifold. And that's because we saw that in this theory of harmonic multivalued functions, one important ingredient when you have a, an harmonic multivalued function is the possibility of being able to subtract from each branch the average of the branches, which is a classical harmonic function. And that kind of normalizes your multivalued function to have average zero pointwise. And it was an essential ingredient to actually get the regularity theorem. And OK, so doing this on the area minimizing current is the hardest part of the proof because even assuming that your area minimizing current has a nice structure as a multivalued function, the average of the sheets does not satisfy any obvious PDEs because you're averaging among functions which are solving a nonlinear PDE. So the linear combination is not leading you any, anywhere. OK, now at the point and, and the final step is that once you have a center manifold, you could really approximate efficiently your current on the normal bundle of the center manifold, which would allow you in a situation where the example of branching is instead something like this. OK, an example in which a first harmonic approximation wouldn't pick up the branching singularity. Uh, well, it's the other way around, actually which is a very high order perturbation, but the first harmonic approximation around the point zero would just pick up this part, which is kind of the regular part of your Taylor expansion, if you want. So the center manifold is capturing all regular uh, uh, um, polynomials in a kind of hypothetical Taylor expansion for, for objects of this kind. So until I first encounter the uh, uh, real singularity. Okay, and then so the, then sort of from a blow-up argument, you conclude. And by blow-up argument, I mean by assuming that the current has too many singularities, the singularities with cluster somewhere. At this point, uh, um, since the singularities are, are are too many, there are too many cluster points. I can hope to find a cluster point where I find uh, um, a flat tangent plane. At that flat tangent plane, I construct my center manifold. I construct my approximation from the center manifold. I rescale. I use a compactness argument. This is converging to harmonic multiple valued function, which has too many singularities because the fact that I have my approximation on the center manifold makes true that the singularities of the current are inherited by the harmonic uh, uh, um, blow up, what we call blow up, so what, what we call limit of the rescaled sequences. OK, so now let us come to the boundary regularity. OK, so of course, one thing which was, I mean, it's worth mentioning. So the thing that in codimension one gives you the full regularity and that also in higher codimension gives you a starting point is that if in this flat, I mean, if, if in this stratum I look at the points where not only I know that one tangent cone is flat, but I know that the flat tangent cone is not picking up any higher multiplicity. So where I know that there is one tangent cone which is going to be a plane with multiplicity one, that is actually regular by a theorem, which is an epsilon regularity theorem, which, which started with the Georgi in the 50s, okay? And which nowadays is called Arnold's regularity theorem. Okay, so when I'm looking now at boundary regularity, my situation is that I have a, a um, regular curve, for instance, and then I'm looking at two-dimensional objects which bound this curve and which are minimizing, so currents, as we said. So now I fix a point at the boundary, and I'm interested on the regularity at that point. OK, so one first thing which is uh, uh, known since the pioneering work of, uh, of Allard is that there is a boundary monotonicity formula. And the boundary monotonicity formula allows you to do the same thing as you do in the interior. You actually can attach tangent cones at the boundary. OK, now, again, I have tangent cones at the boundary. You would image naively that you have a situation like this. 
right? So here I have sort of my, my boundary which flattened out and my tangent cone is looking like a bunch of half planes which are joining, right, at this boundary. But it's not obvious actually. I might have a situation like this. I might have this tangent cone which is actually seeing some other tangent cone which is coming from some other part of the current, okay? Because if the curve is kind of winding around in a complicated way, nobody's telling you that uh, a portion of the surface is not coming back and reintersect the boundary, okay? So I, I could easily actually uh, make examples for this. So if you allow me to disconnect, if you allow me to disconnect the boundary, so if this were the three-dimensional sphere, which I obviously cannot um, draw, so on the three-dimensional sphere, I could take one equator, so let's say the equator x1 squared plus x2 squared equal 1 and x3 equal x4 equal 0, okay? Then I could take the opposite equator, okay? And if I take these two disks, I mean these two circles on S3, the unique minimizer is going to be the two planes x1, x2 equals 0 and x3 equal x4 equals 0 which meets at the origin alone, okay? Now if instead of taking this equator, I cut the equator and I take a half circle as boundary like this, so the origin will be a point at the boundary, okay? And it will see, uh, as, a, as, a, as a tangent cone, it will see the half plane, which is coming from x3 equal x4 equal 0. But then it will see the full plane, which is coming down from x1 equal x2 equal 0. So the tangent cone is not going to be simply a half plane. It's, it's going to be a half plane and a full plane over here. OK? So you start seeing why there is an advantage as I, as, I, as I said in my, in my first talk, if you assume that this boundary curve is, for instance, connected and it's lying on the boundary of a convex set. Well, even if you drop the connectedness, I mean, when the boundary data is lying on the boundary of the convex set, the convex set acts as a barrier for your minimizer and it doesn't allow a portion of the interior surface to cross the boundary, okay? So it excludes that situation. And it will be really the case that you only see kind of a tangent cone which might have this structure. Okay, so when you add some convexity assumption. Now, when you add some convexity assumption, it's another theorem of Allard that in fact, all the tangent cones are going to be the best ones that you could opt for. So they're going to be half planes. So if gamma, the boundary data, lies on, lies on the boundary of a convex set, you actually has to be a uniformly convex set, then all tangent cones are half planes with multiplicity 1. Okay, and then after proving this in his PhD thesis, so he also proved another fundamental result that is at every point where there is at least one tangent cone which has this minimal multiplicity possibility, that point must be regular. Okay, so that is called Allard's boundary regularity theorem which is valid under more general assumption and which would tell you that if you're lying on the boundary of a convex set, then you're fine. So every x where, the tan where one tangent cone is a half plane with multiplicity one, 
is regular. Okay, so, so far so good. Now you can again apply this kind of soft argument, which is called Almgren stratification theorem. Although the first place in which it actually appeared, it's a paper by Brian White, where this, this, this kind of approach has been generalized to several uh, different situations. So if you don't have the convexity assumption, you can at least say, so without convexity assumptions, You can say that except for a set of of co-dimension 2, so of dimension m minus 2, if m is the dimension of the minimizer, so called dimension 1 in the boundary. So there is at least one tangent cone. which has the following shape. So it is the union of, a finite, of finitely many half lines multiplied by multiplied by a plane of dimension m minus 1. Okay? Of course, this m minus 1 dimensional plane that you're multiplying with is nothing but the tangent to the boundary value gamma. So this ridge over here is just simply the tangent at your point p to your boundary value gamma, or to your boundary surface gamma, which is assumed to be regular, of course, in all this business. Now, on the other hand, you can easily imagine, so since here you must have multiplicity 1 for the boundary, okay, you must simply uh, imagine that if you have these lines which are meeting at this point, algebraically they have to sum in such a way that the multiplicity of the point as a boundary is 1. Okay? So if you have, I mean, if, if I'm orienting my lines, so take away the core and I'm orienting my lines, I must have a situation where I have a number of exiting lines, which is one more than the number of lines which is actually entering, okay? in such a way that the algebraic sum of the boundaries at this point is going to be equal to 1. Okay? Now, it's pretty easy to see that if you have such a situation, it's a very simple computation with a little bit of combinatorics. It's very easy to see that if you have such a situation, um, then you cannot be minimizer. Okay, why you cannot be minimizer? Because for instance, take this line which is entering here and which is exiting there, right? This broken line. This broken line is not creating any boundary. And if this broken line is not creating any boundary, I can actually remove by adding a segment over here. I'm saving length because by the triangle inequality, this segment has less length, but I'm keeping the boundary the same because now I have one line exiting and no line actually entering. So the boundary will still be equal to 1. Okay? So at the situations where you have these tangent cones, actually this is forbidden. The only thing that might happen is that you have one line entering with multiplicity, say, q minus 1, and one line exiting with multiplicity q. Okay? So there is one single line in which you're staying, so your tangent cone is actually completely flat, but instead of having the situation in which you have multiplicity 1 on one side and 0 on the other side, so only seeing this, you have a situation in which you have multiplicity q minus 1 on one side and q on the other side. Okay? So that is what we will call a two-sided boundary point. So a boundary point in which this multiplicity is jumping from something positive to something positive instead of jumping from 0 to 1. Okay? Now, can this happen, actually? 
And the answer is yes, it can happen because even in three dimensions, if you take if you take say a circle of this type okay and a larger circle which are oriented in the same way and you take the minimizer of the area for this boundary you will find the union of two disks Okay, now if I make my circle come close to, in such a way that they lie on the same plane, in the limit, I'm going to see an inner disk with multiplicity 2 and an outer corona with multiplicity 1. Okay? This is a perfectly legal situation. So this is a minimizer. And all the points in the inner circle are actually two-sided. Now, so far so good. Since I know that actually the places where I'm not flat are a few, so it's a set of dimension m minus 2. Since I know that when I am flat and one-sided, I have Allard's boundary regularity theorem, the only point in having a boundary regularity theory in general is to be able to actually deal with these two-sided points. Now, the convexity assumption that I was telling you, so if your curve gamma is lying on a convex set, is forbidding the two-sided situation. So all boundary points have to be one-sided, and then you would apply Allard's regularity theorem. If you give me even a very bad boundary curve, but in Rn, I can start from the origin, and I can take the outermost point. And on the outermost point, I would have actually a barrier which is telling me that the tangent cone has to be only one-sided when I am at that point. And then I would be able to apply Allard's boundary regularity theorem as well. So of course I really encounter the very bad situation of having no boundary regular points to which I can apply Allard under the assumption that I am, for instance, on a closed manifold. And then I cannot do, I cannot use the barrier arguments, I cannot find the point where I'm forced from a barrier to lie only on one side. Okay, so here is what we can prove. So essentially, so Allard is telling you flat, one sided. Boundary points are regular. And our theorem, which is a joint work with um, uh, Guido De Filippis, Jonas Hirsch, and Annalisa Massacesi, is saying so flat two sided boundary singular points form a meager set. And so therefore, when you actually add all the things together, since the points which are actually left is a set of points of co-dimension 2, or co-dimension 1 in the boundary, then you have that the set of regular points at the boundary are actually a dense open set. That's a corollary. So the set of regular points is a dense open set. OK, so now, although this is, although this is uh, um, kind of the, the end of the story, and I will tell you the difference with the interior regularity, let me make one kind of funny remark. So you see the situation is obviously very, very unlikely. I mean, not only I must have actually two different components, 
right? I mean, if you have only one single component for your boundary, you would imagine it's impossible to do something like this, OK? But even if I have more than one component, you see this curve is very special. Because once you have regularity, you will know that this curve is lying in the interior of a minimal surface. Now, a minimal surface, for instance, in Rn, would be a real, a real analytic surface. So if you give me a random curve in R3, it's not a subset of a real analytic two-dimensional surface, generically. Okay? So it's a very non-generic situation. And in fact, as a corollary of this theorem, we can actually say the following. So if my boundary data is connected, then there are no two-sided singular points, uh, regular points. And what you would expect and what one PhD student of mine is working on is a kind of statement that tells you if you give me a family, I mean, if you give me the space of all smooth boundary data, so for instance, if you give me uh, um, two curves in R4, and you just take the um, family of all possible C2, uh, uh, gamma pair of curves in R4, generically, the minimizer is not going to have regular two-sided points. Okay, so it's a non-generic situation what is happening over here. And this, is, this should be an outcome of our regularity theorem, but, but she's still working at it. Okay, so guided by our intuition from, from uh, yesterday in the interior, let's see what you could try to do. Okay, so you could try simply to think the following. So say that here you have your tangent, I mean you have a point where the multiplicity is going to be say two on one side and one on the other side, okay? Ideally you would expect that your minimizer is going to be something which is two valued on the right of your boundary data and one valued on the other side. And somehow the two sheets on the, on the right and the sheet on the left, they must kind of come together in such a way that one of the sheet on the right is continuing on the sheet on the left, so it creates no boundary. And the extra sheet that I have on the right is responsible for the creation of boundary. Okay? So, out of the same type of arguments that we saw yesterday, if my current is very flat and I have this graphical structure, I'm expecting that this graph is minimizing the Dirichlet energy. Okay? or it's almost an approximate minimizer of the Dirichlet energy. For a kind of strange Dirichlet boundary condition, so the strange Dirichlet boundary condition is that I have this kind of two sheets on one side and one sheet on the other side, and in some way that I have to specify, one sheet is continuing and the other one is creating a certain boundary, and that is the boundary value, that is the Dirichlet data that I have for my harmonic function. Okay, then of course, when I cut out here on a disk, then I will have also one sheet over here and the two sheets over there, which are also assigned, right? So I, I kind of have a weird boundary value situation in which I have uh, two boundary data on this side, one boundary data on this side, and then something which has a strange nature on the interface in between, okay? Now, you, 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 you would kind of, Worry whether this, I mean, whether you can cook up a, a, a space of uh, functions which have this structure on which you can minimize the Dirichlet energy. And this is what we do in our paper. So in our paper, we make a theory of what we call Q minus one half valued functions. And the Q minus one half is because we have Q values on one side and q minus values on the other side, and of course the average of the two numbers is q minus one half, okay? Of course the classical case in which q is equal one, I have a single valued function, so a half valued function because I'm only taking this function on sort of the right side, okay? You can minimize the area, sorry, you can minimize the Dirichlet energy in this constant context.
And as a corollary, so if you, if you remember yesterday, what I told you is that Amgren's theory is giving you two things. That the minimizers of the Dirichlet energy is a continuous function, and that the singular set for the minimizer has co-dimension 2 in the domain. Okay? So the first thing that you would bother is whether I give you a boundary datum, which is not too bad. After all, we are mimicking the situation of, of, of the uh, uh, plateau problem for area minimizing currents, so the boundary datum might be actually a smooth surface. And I want to know whether the minimizer over here is continuous. And that actually is an outcome of a uh, much more general theorem, which is a boundary regularity theorem for minimizers of the problem of Almgren. Of course, somehow in this strange situation, you could just say, OK, let us say that I fix the function on the left side. On the right side, I have a minimizer for a genuine q valued function which has boundary data on this half disk. Okay? So if I'm able to prove uh, continuity at the boundary for a minimizer of the Angren problem, then of course I'm able to prove continuity at the boundary also for this situation, which is a special case. Okay? So that is actually the PhD thesis of Jonas Hirsch. I mean, the PhD thesis contains several other stuff, but one of the things that it contains is that there is boundary regularity, uh, boundary continuity for minimizers of uh, um, uh, the Dirichlet energy in the space of multivalued functions, in the usual space of multivalued functions. OK, so continuity, and in fact, it's Hölder continuity at the boundary is OK. Now, for us, this is not. A boundary is what we call the interface, right? So because it's a special boundary compared to that. OK, so now if you remember yesterday, what we discussed is the following situation. As a model problem, if you have a two-valued harmonic function, you have the continuity, so in the neighborhood of every point where you have two different values. Your two-valued harmonic function detaches into two harmonic branches, and it's fully regular. So the problematic points are the collapsed points. And what we actually saw yesterday is that the theory of Almgren with this frequency function forbids to have a sequence of collapsed points which is converging to one collapsed point. Okay? So the collapsed points are isolated. Or if there is a sequence which is converging to a collapse point, this can only happen if in a neighborhood of this point everything is collapsed. So you are two copies of the same harmonic function. Okay? So at the beginning when we were trying actually to do this, regularity theory, we hoped to have exactly the same situation for this problem over here. But now actually we know that this is false. So we have a counterexample. So the counterexample, I also mentioned it in the, in the first lecture, because it's a counterexample to this problem, but then it turns out it's also a counterexample to the regularity for area minimizing currents in general. So I have a situation in which q is equal to, of course then q minus 1 is equal 1. Okay, and now I have a boundary value here, g. So I have these two sheets over here. So on here, I would have kind of, I mean, the ideal regular situation is a situation in which I have a two-valued function on one side, which is one sheet which is lying upstairs independently, and one sheet below which takes the boundary. So this would be a regular point. Singular points are points in which the upper sheet and the lower sheet come actually together, okay? And they touch. And we have an example in which these Touching collapse points actually converge to a touching collapse point. So we have a situation in which we can show that the singular set of your minimizer u is not discrete. It has an accumulation point. So that actually tells you that if you're trying to prove exactly the same thing that Angren proved, it's impossible. OK, 
Okay, we can, however, deal with some baby situation. Okay, so the baby situation looks like a very special situation, but it's actually good enough to run at least uh, a program to get the, the boundary regularity theorem that I told you. And the baby situation is the situation in which the boundary data at the interface over here is identically zero. boundary data at the interface is equal to 0. So if the boundary data at the interface is equal to 0, and in fact we have a slightly stronger theorem, if the boundary data at the interface is real analytic, and you have an interface which is real analytic, this is actually not happening. So the singular set has to be discrete. And we have also another corollary. So this situation is okay. So we have a corollary which for us is fundamental. So assume not only to know that the boundary data is equal to zero, but assume to know that for some weird reason the minimizer comes with all the sheets collapsing from one side and all the sheets collapsing from the other side. So if u is collapsed at the boundary, then what we can actually conclude is that there was a single harmonic function going through the interface. And my q minus 1 half value function is kind of fake. It's a q minus 1 copy of this harmonic function on the left and q copies of the harmonic function on the right. Okay, so all the sheets are actually sandwiched. So then let me say this corollary is that if u is collapsed at the boundary, then it is actually totally collapsed. Okay, so now I can give you actually the steps of the proof of the theorem for the area minimizing currents. Of course, all of these steps are, I mean, some of them are, are unusually complicated, but, but at least the basic strategy is kind of clear. So the first thing that I want to do is the following. So assume you have, no, 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 each step is maybe some 20, 30 pages. Well, some of them are actually easier. So the whole proof, the whole proof, I said it's 200 pages in the first talk, but this was just to scare uh, the audience. It's actually 150 last I checked in, in our current version. So, and it's not growing right now. I mean, it, we are only proofreading. So assume you have a, uh, okay, so I, uh, let's say, let's, let's maybe even just kind of consider the following baby case, right? So we have these flat points at the boundary okay then we know that if they have multiplicity one half so if there is only one sheet on one side and zero sheet on the other sides they are regular so one half multiplicity is regular Okay, so the first enemies are the ones with three half multiplicity. So they have two sheets on the right and one sheet on the left. Okay, and the first thing that I want to show you is that singular set, singular points with multiplicity three halves have no, I mean, have empty interior. Okay, so the first enemy is a point X of multiplicity 3 half which 
is surrounded I mean a singular point of multiplicity 3 half which is surrounded by points of multiplicity 3 half Okay, so that's the first enemy. The fact that you can really reduce to this situation is not obvious because, I mean, there's, there's some things that you have to play with the monotonicity formula and with the uh, semi-continuity of, of the density at the boundary, but, I mean, it's a soft argument. Okay, so this is the first enemy, so this is the enemy that you, that you have isolated and there is some work to say that this is the enemy, so this is A. And then, of course, I will make an induction, right? So then I will care about the one with multiplicity 5 over 2, 7 over 2, and so on. But, but the proof is essentially the same at each step of the induction. So it, it, it doesn't make a big difference. OK, so now I have this portion of my boundary. And I know that this is a point of multiplicity 3 half. But I know actually that in this portion of the boundary, the multiplicity is 3 half everywhere. So essentially, I have locally the picture that when I zoom into this point, at least at some scale, I see two sheets on one side and one sheet on the other. Okay? I can actually globalize this picture, and on some scale, I can approximate my current with a function that has two sheets on the right and one sheet on the left. Okay? So approximate with a three half valued function. Now, here I think it's kind of important the type of technique that we have to make this approximation as compared to Amgren's approximation. So our approximation here gives a very efficient way of doing this. In particular, we can use the information that each of these points is 3 half valued to show that this approximation can be taken with the property that it is collapsing at the interface. So not only it's a 3 half uh, valued approximation, but it's done in such a way that the sheets come together at the boundary from the side where you are too valued. Okay? Of course, just to be sure that we understand each other, I'm always actually drawing these pictures as if I have an uh, upper sheet and a lower sheet. It's by no means going to be this way. I don't know what is actually happening in here. It's a whole messy situation in which I can have branching points and things are kind of remixed all together. Right? So I, I don't have any classical thing. Anyway, once I have this, I can use this corollary to say that my strange two-valued, one-valued situation is actually very close to be a single harmonic function with one value from one side and two values from the other side. Okay? This is actually the situation of Allard's or the Georgi type regularity theorems which allows you to implement a Mordi type estimate and show that as a corollary, so, so this is step C, so the tangent plane at each of these collapse points is unique thing which would not be obvious. And as you actually go, so this is the tangent plane at the boundary. So this tangent plane at the boundary, as you actually move along the boundary, not only it's unique, but it depends on a C alpha way from the point, with alpha arbitrarily close to 1. And C alpha dependence on the point P. OK, so now once I've done that, you remember from yesterday that one of the nightmares was this center manifold, which is actually the biggest bulk of the proof of Angren. So now I know that when I am 
away from the boundary, I can construct a centered manifold because I know it from our interior regularity theory. So now what I do is I take the boundary, make a Whitney type decomposition of what is on this side, make a Whitney type decomposition of what is on the other side, and construct a center manifold on each of these kind of squares, which are far away from the boundary. With a lot of additional work, what I can show is that these center manifolds, they actually patch together to a single center manifold, which is arriving at the boundary, up to the boundary. And I can do it from the right and from the left. So I can construct a right and left center manifold. OK, now I construct the right and left center manifolds, but this step C is fundamental to say the following, that the two center manifolds, which actually happen to be C3 alpha on each of their regions, so there is C3 alpha on one side and C3 alpha on the other side, they actually come and pass through the boundary data. And not only they pass through the boundary data, but they also get exactly the same tangent because the tangent that they get is the unique tangent plane that I have proved to exist. So the left and right center manifold, they actually piece into a C11 single manifold. So M, which is the union of M plus and M minus, is actually C11. Only C11, though, because on the second derivatives, I don't have a matching condition. I don't know if the second derivatives coming from the right match actually the second derivatives coming from the left. OK, so this uniqueness of the tangent planes actually comes with an additional information. So my current is supported in what is called the Horn neighborhood of the, of the boundary. So, and this Horton neighborhood is kind of, okay, so it's, it's, it's not really like this because this would be a Horton neighborhood in which it's, it's kind of two uh, flat things, right? So, so here I have a tangent which is kind of varying. So it would be, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a surface that I cannot exactly draw. I, I don't have the skill to draw this. But, I mean, you have to imagine that at each point you have this tangent which can vary, and then at each tangent you can, you can make two, uh, say, uh, um, kind of paraboloids and your surface is sandwiched inside here. Now, I'm, I'm drawing here paraboloids, but they're not really paraboloids. They're more like something which is going like modulus of x to the power 1 plus alpha. And the alpha is this alpha over here. So they're not like a kind of modulus of x squared. OK, but the very good information that I get from this is the following. So on each of the center manifolds, which is on the left and on the right, So here I have the left center manifold, and here I have the right center manifold. Again, I can use the theory in the interior, and I can approximate my current on each of these cubes, right? So here I can approximate my current efficiently with Lipschitz functions. Now, since I have this sandwiching condition, what I actually know is when I patch all together my Lipschitz approximations, which I will do with a certain algorithm, they will continue until they collapse at the boundary by this Horde neighborhood. So what I'm just telling you is that if I apply the theory from the interior, I get an approximating function from the left and an approximating function from the right. And the approximating function from the right on the normal bundle collapses to Q values Q, Q times the value 0 at the boundary. And the approximation from the left collapse to Q minus 1 values 0 from the other side. OK? So there exists a collapsed Q minus 1 half valued approximation on this center manifold M minus union M 
plus. Okay? Now I want to do exactly the same thing that I did in the interior. I mean, I want to, so this I have it at every scale. I want to zoom into the point and actually say that in the limit, I'm converging to a dir minimizer. And now this time, what I want just to say is that, so yesterday I want to say that the uh, um, sort of um, singular points were inherited by the limit. Now what I want to say is the following. If my approximation is non-trivial, so if it is Q copies of the center manifold on the right, and Q copies, Q minus one copies of the center manifold from the left, then of course I'm happy. I'm perfectly regular at that point, which is a contradiction to, the, to my starting assumption. But if it is non-trivial, I want actually to redivide by the Dirichlet energy, so to normalize it to have Dirichlet energy equal to one, and then I want to take a limit of that. And as a limit of that, I want to find, so rescale and normalize, as a limit of that, so the limit is a non-trivial Q minus one half minimizer which has average zero on the right and average zero on the left and which has positive Dirichlet energy. Well, ideally Dirichlet energy equal to one because I've normalized the sequence so to have Dirichlet energy equal to one. So uh, non-trivial Q minus one half minimizer with average zero. Now, since they are, the sheets are all collapsed at the interface, I will have then this situation. So a minimizer of my problem which is non-trivial, it has Q minus one sheets over here and Q sheets on this other side. But if you remember the regularity theory for the DIR minimizers was telling me that this was impossible. So this was only possible if the Q minus one sheets on the left are collapsed and the Q sheets on the right are collapsed. But since the Q minus one sheets on the left and Q sheets on the right should have average zero, this can only happen if you are Q times zero on the right and Q minus one times zero on the left, okay? And since I'm telling you that the Dirichlet energy is positive because it's a limit of functions with Dirichlet energy equal to one, I get a contradiction, okay? So now, to make this process run, it's important that I show that the Dirichlet energy of the sequence is converging to the Dirichlet energy of the limit. Okay, and here it's where this frequency function estimate at the boundary enters crucially. Okay, so to ensure non-triviality. And so you see what is the kind of connection to the problem that I said in the first day. So essentially I'm zooming, I mean if I were zooming an actual harmonic function, when I'm renormalizing the Dirichlet energy to be equal to one, what I hope to pick up at that point is the first non-trivial uh, uh, polynomial in the Taylor expansion. And so who's guaranteeing me that that actually exists, that the function doesn't have infinite order of contact with my uh, 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 sort of uh, with, with, with my center manifold is this frequency function estimate of R. Okay, so one last remark. So yesterday I told you that for the interior computation it's absolutely fundamental that the center manifold is C3 alpha. And now I'm telling you that this center manifold is C3 alpha from one side and C3 alpha from the other side, but it's only C11 on the boundary. So what actually happens is that once you make the computation for this monotonicity function, for the, the monotonicity of this frequency function, you kind of make all, all your computations on the right where you are C3 alpha, you make all computations from the left where you are C3 alpha, 
And then, I mean, there is an integration by parts to kind of um, bring, I mean, the value of, of an integral has to be equal to zero. And if you do it on one side and if you do it on the other side, what you can do is to integrate by parts and, you know, look at what is the contribution from the two sides, from the right and from the left side. Okay? So now, if I, when I'm not, I mean, if I try to do this in the interior and I'm not C3 alpha, I will get a, a contribution from the right that doesn't cancel with the contribution on the left. Okay? But the information that my sheets are collapsing in the computation gives me that the derivatives on the right are multiplied by the height of the function on this boundary, which is equal to zero. So although my center manifold is only C3 alpha on one side and C3 alpha on the other side, the fact that I have zero value for my approximating function makes a boundary term essentially disappear. And then I don't need, instead of, instead of uh, knowing that uh, uh, in the interior, if I had a cartoon picture like that, I, I wouldn't know the collapsing, but I would know C3 alpha along the way. So if I make the computation on one side and I make the computation on the other side, I integrate by parts and this matches because the second and third derivatives matches actually on the interface. So in this case, the fact that the function is identically equal to zero makes actually each of the two contributions disappear. And then I don't need C3 alpha, but I have only C11. Of course, in retrospect, at the end of the day, I've proved that the point is regular. I've proved that my area minimizing current on the right is two times of the center manifold on the right. On the left is one time the center manifold on the left. If I take away multiplicities, I have a single minima surface which is actually passing through my boundary, right? And minima surfaces are real analytic, so actually Although I started with the C11 center manifold, at the end of the day, I also know that the second and third derivatives match. And actually, my, my center manifold is C3 alpha. But this is just a, a, an outcome. At the end, I wouldn't know how to prove, actually, that the two derivatives matches uh, uh, um, without going through all the proof of this story. OK, that's it. Multiplicity three times. So when you this contradiction, I mean, which is like yes. Okay, so I saw, I told you at a certain point that it's uh, fundamental to show you that this approximation is actually uh, uh, going all the way here together. Okay? So essentially, I use the, monoton the monotonicity formula for these points here to say that these sheets have to come together. Because, I mean, if the sheets wouldn't come together, uh, uh, so say if, if one of the sheets somehow would sort of escape and join with the other sheet upstairs, I would be left with two little mass on this particular point at a certain scale. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the fact that all the points have multiplicity 3 half, and in fact, by this argument, I don't need exactly that they are multiplicity 3 half, but I need a lower bound. I need that they are multiplicity very close to 3 half, 3 half minus epsilon at least. They could be even higher somehow. Then I know that the sheets have to collapse. And then once the sheets have to collapse, I have this approximation with the harmonic function, then I have the decay, then I can construct the center manifold, and so on and so forth. Without this, I mean, I, 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 could, I could do step one. I could do, I could do the, this multi-valued q minus one, minus one half approximation. But then I wouldn't know that the um, sheets are collapsing at the boundary. And then I couldn't run the rest of the argument. Now, uh, okay, I have to also say maybe one thing. So I told you for my argument, I just need a lower bound on the multiplicity, okay? On the other hand, you have the upper semi-continuity of the density that tells you that a point of multiplicity 3 half must be surrounded by points which have approximately multiplicity less than 3 half plus epsilon. So at the end of the day, once I have, I mean, I mean the, the information that I need is the uh, kind of bound from below, but this is equivalent to the fact that essentially all the points on, 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 on this, uh, on, 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 on this uh, boundary in the neighborhood of this point, they have multiplicity exactly 3 half. 
So the two things actually happen to, to be equivalent at the end of the day. But in, in, in first approximation, I only need a lower bound.